Good morning, Journey. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here today. We're going to worship the Lord together. Why don't we stand? We'll start with a word of prayer, and then we'll enter into our time of worship today. <clears throat> Father, thank you for a new day of life, a new beginning. Every day with you is a new beginning. And so we confess our sin to you. We exhale and we inhale and breathe in your Holy Spirit today. We ask for your Holy Spirit today to have his way in us. Help us to be open to your leading, to follow you, to honor you, and to be able to praise you with joy this morning. You are good and your steadfast love endures forever. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>
God, thank you for being with us through all of the trials and trouble of life. Has God been good to you this week? Yeah. Yeah. I think it should make us sing a little bit louder. Praise will ever be on my 
no idea what we were missing before giving our lives to you. Um, we thought we were stepping into religion. We stepped into a relationship, a living, enduring, abiding, close, closer than a brother relationship. And we have come to find, as we have known you more and more and longer and longer, that you are truly beautiful. And we want to adore you. In Jesus' name. <clears throat>
and strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. And I won't be formed by feelings. I hold fast to what is true. And if the cross brings transformation, I'll be crucified with you. Because death is just a doorway into resurrection life. If I join you in your sufferings, I'll join you when you rise. When you return in glory with all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be singing and my song will be the same. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Christ be magnified on the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me again. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified on the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. Christ be magnified in us. Oh, we adore you. Oh, hear the cry of our hearts, Lord. Amen. Go ahead, be seated. It was about four years ago that Bridger Walker, age six, was playing in a yard of a friend of their family's, and he was playing with his younger sister, who was age four, and a large German shepherd uh, came after them, uh, tried to attack his sister, and the little guy jumped in front of her and screamed for her to run away and took the mauling. Um, Could we put the picture up? had about 90 stitches in the work that was done on him, uh, but he possibly saved his sister's life, or at least saved her from a great injury. And what he told his mom was, he said, if someone had to die, I thought it should be me. And we admire sacrificial love, don't we? And every week, as Christians, we gather, and part of our gathering is to celebrate the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ, that he left heaven for us, he took on flesh, lived life on our terms, and offered that perfect sinless life on the cross so that we could be forgiven and set free. Now, gratefully, the cross is not the end of the story. He rose from the dead, and so we have the confidence and certainty of heaven if we have chosen to follow Jesus Christ. And so, We want to take the time of communion to remember and celebrate that sacrificial love of Jesus. The bread represents his body that was offered for us on the cross. The juice represents his blood that was spilled in that incredible act of sacrificial love for you and for me. We also have offering baskets if you want to participate in the offering. If you're new, there are four stations, one table at each corner of the room. And we just invite you, if you're a follower of Christ, to participate in the Lord's Supper. If you're not yet, just use this as a time of reflection and prayer. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for each person here. Lord, we are so grateful for your love. It is staggering. Despite our sin, despite our rebellion, you love us. I pray that each of us would feel that to the very core of our being. And Lord, I pray that this simple visual aid that your son left for us would just strike a chord deep in us and remind us of how deeply you love us. Lord, this is our prayer in the name of your son. Amen.
I invite you to participate in the Lord's Supper and the offering. Well, today we're going to talk about marriage, and so I thought we should actually talk to some married people. So how about you all introduce yourselves? I am Jeff Welch. And I'm Nicole Welch. All right, so we're just going to ask a few questions here. First question is, how does your Christianity impact your marriage? There's kind of a running joke that the only thing we have in common is that we like each other. <laughs> it's not true. There, we do have more in common than that, but... Uh, we tend to be complementary, not necessarily, you know, parallel all the time, but our faith is something that is absolutely one of those foundational commonalities. It's something that uh, sometimes that w when we've, jo we've made that joke that, um, man, we don't have a lot in common, do we? Uh, it's like uh, only the most essential things do we have in common, right? The most important and valuable things. And so I think that Sometimes we'll look at other couples who, you know, they love to hike together. We, we like to kayak and do stuff like that, right? But they like to go on these adventures together that they just both really enjoy the exact same thing. And we're like, we don't always enjoy the exact same thing. But I don't know. You can find a lot of people to hike with. Um, but you kind of want to be paired with somebody who at an essential level, like, we have the same belief about why we're here and where we're going and what it's all about. So I think for me, that's like, it is the essence and the essential foundation of our marriage. Yeah, and we've had the benefit of both being raised in Christian homes with parents who have been married for 50 plus years, and so we've seen the faithfulness of God in their marriages, and that's been a great example, I think, to 
us to make sure we're putting God first in our marriage. Okay. How do you, um, or what advice would you give to a newly married couple just starting out? I think that there's lots of great advice out there, but I think one thing that strikes me is that you need people other than your spouse in your life. You need friends. I think that for the first couple of years of our marriage, we were pretty enamored with each other, um, and it was about your... Th- yeah, 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 yeah. It was about year three where I was like, I need a friend. Um, and just the importance of the fact that you need, you need a well-rounded life. You need girlfriends. You need church friends. You need um, family and people that, that feed into you. You need couple friends that encourage you and challenge you. So I, my advice to couples is find some friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I've been a musician for a long time, and Nicole is not that. And so if I expect, like, that's an important part of my life, and if I expect her to just be the person that fulfills that for me and is like, every time I hear a great song, I look at her and she's like, yeah, I get it too, um, then I'm going to be disappointed a lot because she doesn't. We, we'll listen to the same song and I'll be like, oh, man, that was powerful. And she was like, okay. <laughs> and so, like, I need friends in my life who I can share that part with and who we really have a, a similarity um, because she can't be everything. To ask her to be everything to me uh, is a lot. Uh, she is absolutely enough for me, and I, I hope that I'm enough for her, but um, we are still individual people who we, we're just never going to line up on, on every point. And so I do think it's important to have those other influences and other people in your life that fill in some of those gaps because people are complicated. There's a lot going on for us. All right. How do you resolve conflict in your relationship? <laughs> um, so this is kind of where the differences work for us because Jeff, as you can tell, is a communicator. He likes to talk. Um, I'm kind of a powder when I get upset. <laughs> and so having, uh, being able to play to his strength to make sure we're talking things out, and it sounds cliche, but don't go to bad angry, like those are real things. Those are things where you don't let things fester so for us, I think it's really just being able to talk about things, even when we're hurt, even when we're upset, even if we need a little time, getting it out and in the open so that we can resolve the issue is kind of how we, we handle conflict. As, as we were talking for some of this, we, we noted that we have some friends who can get in a fight on a Sunday and not talk until Thursday and literally just be strangers in the same house for four days because they just refuse to have that interaction. And I, I can't tolerate that. Like, I've got to, I'm like, we've got to be working this out, right? Um, and so that, that to me is, is essential. And then also, uh, in your marriage, in your friendships, in your business, in anything, uh, if you cannot entertain the idea that you could be wrong, you're probably going to be in for a world of hurt, right? At some point, I think in every relationship, we, we have this conflict and uh, maybe we start off pretty convinced that we're right, but if at no point in that exchange can we say, what if I'm the problem here? I, I know there was this one time that um, you responded poorly to something that I had done. That's how I'll describe it. And, <laughs> and that my immediate thought was to be upset with her. And then I, like, I reflected a little bit and I'm like, what have I done over time to make that be her default response to me. Like, how am I teeing up this response from her in the way that I'm showing up all the time? And I made the joke yesterday uh, because I can have this tendency to be critical from time to time. And she had done something nice, and so I walked in the room, I was like, oh, thank you for doing that. Here's what you did wrong. And I wasn't really going to point out anything she did wrong, but I'm sure that that's what she hears a lot, is, hey, I really appreciate the effort you put in. Here's all the reasons why I'm gonna now discount it, right? And so sometimes to be able to look at yourself and say, how am, might I be the problem here? I think it goes a long way to opening the door for reconciliation when things maybe aren't lined up. Okay. And the final question is, what has been the hardest part about marriage and what has been a great joy in marriage? So about 20 years ago, um, Nicole got this mystery illness um, and over the course of months and, you know, almost a year of progression, I uh, began losing the ability to walk and her, you know, mobility had reduced tremendously. She would have a hard time uh, breathing sometimes at night. And that's a super scary thing, I think, for any, someone you care about to be experiencing that with them. 
And uh, I can remember, you know, nights where she would come home from work and we lived in this split level house and I would like push her up the stairs because, you know, she, she couldn't manage the stairs by herself. And we would get into bed at six o'clock at night uh, because that she was gassed, right? She had no energy left. And that was, I think those kind of seasons, and they are generally seasons, right? Um, they either bind you together or they break you apart. And for, for us, uh, for me, it was certainly a, a moment where I was like, this is my person, and if, if this is the rest of our life, I'm here for it, right? I'm, I'm in for it. Um, if everything that we'd thought and planned doesn't happen the way that we thought it would, I'm still here, right? And so while that was a really challenging period, to me it also was a period where in reflection, looking back, um, a lot of joy around just realizing that um, those things prove out in real time uh, the, a commitment that is more than just convenience, that is more than just everything's working pretty cool and so I like it, um, but to say, are we here for one another when it gets uglier? Yeah, and being able to look back on that season, I, I often thank God, I don't know what that season was about, but I thank God that I was the patient and Jeff was the caregiver, because I'm not a good caregiver, and so he knew how to get us through that, how, how to get us through that season, um, but I think that's what resonates with me when I think of struggles or even rewards of marriage. It's a season. Everything that happens is a season, and it's going to change, and so you may be in a rough season at times, but it's going to, it's going to change to a good season. That's, that's what life is, and there's nothing more rewarding than 27, almost 27 years in, looking back and, and seeing the life that we built and the daughter that we have and the family that we have and careers that we have and just the way that God has blessed us. All right, let's say thank you. And I do want to mention an opportunity if you want to take advantage of it. So the Zodis are right over here, and I think married like 45 years, I think. Is that about right? Yeah? Okay. Um, they've agreed to go to the conference room after this service, and um, they have some discussion questions about Evan's message you're going to hear about marriage, and they you know, are willing to talk with you about marriage, and I think they know a little bit about marriage. So I encourage you to take advantage of that just down the hall on the right conference room if you want to have a discussion after the service about the topic um, that the message is about, which is marriage. So, all right, Evan, come on up. Thank you. All right, kids and teens, you are dismissed. How exciting is that? Well, good morning, Journey. So, uh, I believe that it's this Thursday is Valentine's Day. Hey! I, I was glad because I was hoping that someone would like, stop! <laughs> it's Wednesday because the joke about, you know, what do I know? <laughs> Natasha gets it. She's laughing over there. So with Valentine's Day just around the corner, what better time to talk about love? And not just any love, true love. Love you. I'm talking about marriage. And so marriage, and this is something that's interesting, is it's going to be the biggest decision that you make in your life aside from following God. Because whether you are in a healthy marriage or an unhealthy marriage will impact every other corner of your life. And the way that your home is will influence every part of you. And so for those of you who aren't married and you're hearing this word, then I would like for you to please engage it from a standpoint of knowing what to be looking for, or maybe to glean something out of it that will help you along in your future marriage. Uh, for those of you who are called to singleness, then I would ask that you would maybe hear this and think of, pull some things that you could give as advice to your friends who are seeking marriage or things like that. And if you are in a, a good marriage, then God bless you and 
I hope that you hear these things and, and meditate on them. And if you're in a rough marriage, what else can I say other than I hope that this helps and that if you need more help, we as a church are here to help you. Marriage is the biggest decision aside from Jesus you're going to make that will affect your quality of life. And I have some Proverbs references to reiterate my point. Don't take my word for it. But doot doot. It's a little reading rainbow reference there. Am I old? Is that dated? But here's what it says It's better to live on a corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. <laughs> And it goes on. A wife of noble character is her husband's crown, but a disgraceful wife is like decay in the bones. And I want you to know that as I picked these and I found them, that in my mind, they're not gender inclusive. What I mean by that is this is not a searing indictment against women saying, like, women, if you're quarrelsome or naggy it's going to just ruin everything because you could also I think have a proverb in there that like better to live in an apartment alone than with a violent man better to live in the tool shed than with a mean-spirited critical man so this goes both ways I just want to throw it out there if you like if you're a lady and you're sitting there going "Uh uh-oh where's he going with all this because there's also but another one that I want to throw up in that a wife of noble character, who can find? Because she is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. It goes on. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. <laughs> Don't look at me. <laughs> somewhere else and so with this that's my wife for those of you who don't know like I'm not just calling out people in the the audience (laughs) but the reason I bring it up is that who you marry is going to impact every corner of your life and those of you who've been in hard marriages know how soul crushing it is and those of you who are in good marriages know what a blessing it is And I, something that I want to tell the, those of you, though, is I want you to know that marriage is not what's going to make you complete as a person. So this is going to be where I begin, is that you know that for those of you who are single, married, dating, wherever you are, you are a complete person in Jesus Christ. And only God can make you whole and complete And this is going to lead into my first point is marriage is a covenant agreement. And to those of you who might not know what covenant means, we in the United States, we call it a contract. It is something where we have an agreement, if you, then I. If you fail to meet these requirements, these are the consequences. That's what a covenant is. And Genesis defines what this covenant is in a way that I think needs to be read and understood. And so it begins in chapter 2. And so if you brought your Bibles, just go ahead, open up, flip a few pages, you'll be there. If you don't know where it is in your Bible, it's on this side. If you hit Exodus, you've gone too far. But here's what it says in chapter 2, beginning in verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, It's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And we're going to skip a few verses Down to when, after God then created woman, created Eve. And the man said about Eve, This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, 
and they felt no shame. And that's how you know they didn't have children. <laughs> Once you have kids, those days are over. <laughs> but here's the thing is that marriage is a covenant. And it says that it's not good for man to be alone. And I had a whole list of jokes, I'll just keep them to myself, but about, you know, like eating canned beans all the rest of the days of your life. But it's not good for man to be alone. And so God created man and woman to be together. And I think the man and woman both have their own unique uh, traits that they bring to the relationship and things that they give to one another. But what I want to zero in on is that they become one flesh. Because this is the union that marriage brings. Is that when you get married, you cease to be an individual and you are now a part of a unit. You are now a family. And so before we muddy these waters, I have a slide actually that kind of depicts a little bit of what I think that that should look like. Because when I say that you cease to be an individual, that's a half-truth, because you do need to have your own individuality. And so if you look at the circles as like your wife and your spouse's life, and you have them, okay, I've got my life, she's got her life, if those circles don't overlap at all, then you don't really have a spouse, you have a roommate. But if they overlap too much, you lose yourself in the relationship. And that's not good either. So before you hear me say, you know, you need to be one unit, one flesh, and someone's like, okay, my life's all about you now, and I have no other interests or hobbies. There needs to be overlap, but not total overlap. But the idea that you're one flesh means you're one unit, you're one family, and for this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and the, what is significant about this is right up until the point when I got married inside the family unit, I was a son. I've not ceased to be a son. My mom still calls me boo-boo, for goodness sakes, like pushing 40. She says, hi, boo-boo. Hi, mom. But my primary responsibility is no longer to my mother and father. My primary responsibility is to my family, my spouse, because now my primary role in the family unit is no longer son, it is now husband. And that's the role that I have received. So this is what we're zeroing in on, the covenant of marriage, that you're one flesh, one unit, and for those of you who are women, you have ceased that your daughter's primary role in the home, your primary role is now wife. And you are one family, a unit. So marriage is that covenant agreement. And this is where we're going to start getting a little countercultural. Because there is an underpinning in our society that says that love is transactional. And what I mean by that is I have heard people say who are like influencers, which is kind of a new, you know, it's only a few years old with the internet, but they say that as soon as your marriage, like once it quits serving you, bail, get out of there. And before that, I think about like the plot to every romantic comedy I have ever seen in my life. One person's in a relationship, but it's not fulfilling them. Another person's in a relationship, but it's not fulfilling them. They meet and they go, oh, you would fulfill me. How do I get out of the one I'm in now? Or as one movie where the woman's leaving her husband and she goes, the heart wants what the heart wants. Yeah. Boo indeed, but that's this idea that we live in this culture where we say that when this quits serving me, I am out. And that I get to decide when to pull the plug. And I always laughed in my mind about how I would love with all my heart that like there would be like a sleepless in Seattle 2 where it's the exact same plot but just with each other 
you know? Like, because where is it going to go from there? And so I'm going to say this, and this is going to be something that, that's really rough, is that cohabitation without marriage, because that's the other thing that I wanted to say, is that did you know that divorce rates are going down? I learned that as I was researching for this. Divorce rates are going down, but they're not going down because people aren't not getting divorced. It's going down because now they just live together, but they don't get married. And so that's the new cultural norm. Because what you're saying is, well, why do we need to go through all this rigmarole and courthouse and signing paperwork and all that when we can just live together? We'll get all the benefits of cohabitation and we'll take none of the risk and take none of the responsibility. Because cohabitation without marriage is really saying, and I'm quoting Tim Keller, and this was a book that he wrote called The Meaning of Marriage, and it really stuck me right between the eyes, is that, because I, I read it before I got married, and he said, if you're, not, if you're living together and you're not getting married, then really what you're saying is I don't love you enough to commit. And that's tough. But if you're dating and you're not looking to get married, you need to say, what am I doing? And make sure everybody knows. And I want you to know that I'm not making a searing indictment against divorce. For those of you in the room who might be feeling a little bit of pressure right now or maybe something is that um, I, there are times when divorce is prudent and necessary. I'll say it. I've counseled people before. Hey, I don't think this, is, this isn't working. This isn't good. Because what do you do when your spouse cheats on you? Where do you go from there? Or what do you do when your husband starts hitting you? Where do you go from there? Or there, uh, I could go into a myriad of examples. I just want you to hear me that if you've been divorced, please don't hear this as some kind of a searing indictment. There are times when it is prudent. But it doesn't change that marriage in the eyes of God is not temporary and it is not self-serving. In marriage, you become one family, one unit, one flesh. And the reason this is important is to understand that in marriage, it's not about what you receive, it's about what you can pour into it. So marriage is this great commitment that you are one unit, one family, and that what you do affects your partner in every way. Because if you do have that overlapping circle, what happens when you jostle? It jostles the other one. So marriage, taken absolutely seriously, with acknowledging that being stuck in a hard marriage is absolutely brutal. So in light of that, I want to share some biblical ways that marriage can work and be beautiful and godly and this wonderful blessing. And it begins in Ephesians 5. And if you were raised in a Christian home, you might think you know where I'm going. But ha, we're going to start in chapter 5, verse 1. And I could have started it in 4, but we only have so much time. But here it is, chapter 5, verse 1. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because such things, God's wrath comes to those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light. In the Lord. Live as children of light, 
For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. Everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it said, wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful how you live then. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish. Understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, songs of the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you might be thinking, what does that have to do with marriage? And the answer is everything. Because where does a healthy marriage start? It does not start with your spouse. It starts with you. Because you cannot control your spouse. And if you think you can or you think you're doing it, it's an illusion. The only thing that you can truly control is yourself. That's the only thing that you have absolute command over is your walk with Christ, your attitude, your behaviors. You need to take responsibility for yourself in your marriage. Because the point of marriage is not to make you whole. That's Jesus' job. Jesus will make you whole. And if you're putting that burden on your spouse, then you and your spouse are going to have a bad time. You need to be about squaring yourself away before you ever start getting anywhere else. Remember the circles I showed you earlier? You're responsible for your own behavior. And before we go to the second half of Ephesians, we need to lock in what came before it. Because before Paul starts giving instructions for the Christian home, he gives instructions for the Christian individual. Because what I read is applicable to everyone in this room. Whether you're married, whether you're single, whether you're a child, whether you're an adult, no matter where you are, that what I read is applicable to you. And what does it say? Do not live as unwise, but live as wise. Seek out righteousness. Seek out holiness. Seek out goodness. And if you start there, then everything that comes after it is going to come into focus. Because to keep going, this is where he says to it, and he picks it up in in, uh, verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. I'm going to take a pause right there. What's he say? Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And that's its own complete sentence. And I think that everything that comes after it comes out of this. And I think that we're going to talk about this submission business a little bit. But remember in the back of your mind, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then he goes on, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife as Christ is head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And he gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. This is back to that one flesh idea. After all, no one hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So what I want to talk before I get into this whole submission business, I want to focus on men. I want to say husbands, love your wives. Why do we need to start here? I'll give you an answer. Is that I've been a minister long enough that I have heard uh, my wife is supposed to submit to me. My wife's not submitting to me as a way to bash a wife more than I have ever had a man come up to me and say, my wife is not biblically loving me. My wife biblically is not respecting, or excuse me, the wife is not saying about the husband, my husband is not loving me 
oh, I'm getting confused, so I'm just going to say, you get where I'm going with that, is that I have had men come up and say, my wife's not submitting to me the way the Bible says, but I have rarely had a woman come up to me and say, my husband is not loving me the way the Bible says. So I want to start with it. Husbands, love your wives. I mean, I have that bold, italicized, husbands, love your wives. We're going to start there. Because I want you to know that I've heard of submission being manipulated and used to justify all manner of wickedness. Even to the point that even though submission to husbands comes first in the order, we're going to start with the idea of loving your wife. Husbands, love your wives. Love them as Christ loved the church. How did Jesus Christ love the church? How did he go about that? He gave himself up for it. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. So if you're a man and you're in a marriage and you're taking this seriously and you're like, okay, i got to love my wife, how do you do that? Is it by thumping her with verses about submission? No. It's by loving her, caring for her, being good to her. When he talked about the obscene joking and there's no room for that, like one of the things that I tell married couples is that men have a way that we talk with one another. I don't talk to my wife the way I talk to my bandmates. I don't talk to my wife the way I talk to guys at the shop. Men can be pretty coarse with one another. Don't treat your wife like that. Because that's not what it means to love her and to be good to her and to look out for her And this is something that for men, we have the greater responsibility in these roles. We have the greater responsibility because as men, we are called the head of the home. Where are we leading it? Are we leading it to goodness? Jesus Christ leads us to green pastures and still waters. Are we leading our families into that? Because when we get to heaven, and those of us who are married men, I don't think that God's going to say, all right, did you wrestle your wife into submission? I don't think that's going to be the question. No, we love our wives in a way that's going to build them up. I'm a human man. I know how difficult it is. But our love for our wives will shine the brightest in adversity. It's easy to love someone when they're doing what you want them to be doing. But what do we do when our spouses are doing something we don't want? Well, we love on them. And we love on them in a way that's going to make them love God even more. Because that's marital godly love. So in light of that, wives, submit to your husbands. The man is the spiritual head of the home. I don't think that this is something that can be abdicated. I don't think that it's something that can be switched on and off. For example, I have a good friend that um, he's sort of a passive fellow, that he's a dear friend of mine, and in the group, he's the guy that if you say, hey, man, where do you want to go eat? He goes, I don't know, where do you want to go eat? And he married a very decisive woman because they complement one another. And so she's the one who determines what they watch on television. She's the one who says where they're going to go eat, and by and large, she's kind of making those decisions. And he came up to me and he said, man, you know, I'm I'm struggling with like, I don't mind this, but it says I'm supposed to be the spiritual head of the home and I'm worried that I might be sacrificing something. And I said, buddy, what you watch on TV and what restaurant you go to does not, (laughs) that's not spiritual headship. Are you praying more? Are you reading the word more? Are you ensuring that your home is pointed towards God and not the world? That's what spiritual headship is. It's not who's doing the finances. It's not who's bringing in the bigger paycheck. It's are you leading your home so that the spiritual presence in that home is godly? Are you pointing your wife, and if you have children, your your children to Christ? Because that's your responsibility, and it's the greater responsibility. Because if you're not leading your family by example as a husband, 
If you're not being the example, then you're depriving them of what they need you to be. So now, women, now that I've said all that about women, submit to your husbands. It's a lot easier when you know that your husband is trying to lead you closer to God, isn't it? It's a lot easier to submit to your husband when you know that he's pursuing righteousness and godliness for your home. It's where it says, don't nag your husband. Don't be quarrelsome with him. Because I can tell you that when a man comes in and he's put in a long, hard work day and he comes home and the children are running around yelling and screaming in circles and it's all bad, like the last thing he needs is to have, you know, walk in and like, I need you to do this, 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 and this. <laughs> I'll get right on it, sweetheart. Can I take my boots off? We, we don't need that. Don't be quarrelsome with your husband. Build him up. Support him. Because when you're both working together in that, then your home will have harmony. More than harmony, it will be gifted with God's presence. It will have joy and laughter and goodness. And that's what it means that for the wife to submit to the husband is to allow him to lead you into still waters. So women, submit to your husband. Respect your husband. Don't try to control your husband. Don't try to control the home. Allow him to lead the family. Because if your husband is following God and you are following your husband, then you're both following goodness. And it will be a rich blessing to you both. And I wrote in here the roles of children because this is an important subject to bring up that I really want to. And if we're going to talk about the roles of the home, um, children are along for the ride. They're not the center focus of your house. They shouldn't be the center focus of your house. I love my kids. I love them dearly. And I am so blessed in what I get to do that I remember when I held Annabelle and I was looking at her, she was just a little baby. I've been a dad for like three days. And I felt like I had this epiphany from God where he said, you do not control this person, but there is no one on the planet on whom you won't have greater influence on. So yeah, I'm preparing them. Because I'm hoping, like, leave the, les- leave the nest, baby bird. I want Saturdays with my wife back. <laughs> But I love my children, but they're not the center of the home. My wife and I are the center of the home. That's the center, our relationship. And the kids come second to that. So, you know, parent, or children submit to your parents, but parents don't exasperate your children. But I think the parents who pour into their kids and they make them the center and the focal point of the house and they're pouring all their energy and all their focus and all their intention into their children, those are the marriages that break up when the kids go to college. Don't invest in your children's relationship more than you're investing in your spouse because your spouse is the one who's still there when the kids go to college. And all these things, in all of it, it begins with you and your discipleship with Jesus Christ. Because if you want to be a good husband, you better make sure you're a disciple of Jesus Christ. If you want to be a good wife, you make sure you're a disciple of Jesus Christ. If you want to be a good son and you want to be a good daughter, you better be a good disciple of Jesus Christ. Because no matter where you are in this sermon, that's what's going to be the linchpin to its success or failure. So husbands, are you squared away? Can you say that in my life there's not even a hint of sexual immorality? Can you say that you are here to love and serve your wife? Or are you trying to make her a glorified maid? Through your spirituality, is your wife growing in her relationship with the Lord? Or is she dragging you to church? Because as a man, you're setting the pace You're setting the spiritual pace of your home. Are you leading your family to God or are you leading them off a cliff? 
This is the hardest question. Are you a man worth your wife's submission? Are you worthy of that? And women, let me ask you, are you following your husband or are you trying to control the house? Are you allowing your husband to lead or are you trying to sabotage that Are you trying to control, not keep it together, but to rule over it? And if that answer is yes, then you are harming it. If you are nagging your husband, if you are trying to control your husband, you are harming your home. Men need your love desperately. They need your respect desperately. Don't withhold that from them because you are one flesh and what you do to your spouse, you do to yourself. So, marriage is serious business and why I started with the idea of covenant in one flesh, one of my favorite things to do in premarital counseling. These fresh-faced you know, kids and they're, they're fired up and their premarital counseling has less to do with them like should or shouldn't we get married. It's generally like we're going to get married and this is part of the process. Is One of the things I love is to tell them just point blank, fold my hands on the table and say, I want you to know that when you tie that knot, the cage is made of steel. <laughs> and I watch their little faces. <laughs> And there's a blessing in that, though, because here's the blessing, is that when both parties understand that this is a permanent arrangement, then you better make an agreement that you're going to make it the best you can, in the same way that if I was on a submarine, I would want to make as many friends as I could. You know, like when you're hot bunking with a group of people yeah, better to have harmony than quarrel in there. Such is with the home. You're in this for the long run. So if you got to work on something, work on it. Don't allow yourself to deteriorate to just become roommates of convenience rather than an intimate marriage. And that's the goodness of marriage, too, is that we're not disposable. How much of our culture is disposable, but not your marriage, not your spouse? Oh, that's the person that you cling to and say, even if the whole world fell away, I'm here. That's the goodness of marriage. So, if you can agree that your marriage is permanent, and you can agree that you are one flesh and what you do to one another impacts yourself. And you can agree that discipleship starts with your individual walk with Jesus Christ, whether you're male or female, whether you're a husband or wife. And you can then agree to the terms and conditions that men, you're supposed to lead your family. You're supposed to lead them to godliness and goodness and righteousness. And women, if you can agree to allow your husband to lead your family in goodness, goodness and righteousness, It's going to throw so much fuel into the fire of your marriage passion and create a home that is a joy to walk into, a pleasure to be in. Culture says marriage will make me happy. Christianity says marriage will make you holy. Culture says spouses are disposable. Christianity says for better or worse. Christian, or culture says we need to be independent of our spouses. But Christianity says you are one flesh. I could go on and on and on and on and on, but this is a good place to, to wrap it up. And so let's pray. Let me pray over your homes, if you would indulge me. Father God, we thank you and bless you that you have given us a roadmap to peace. I thank you that you have given us ideas and knowledge on how to live, not as unwise, but as wise. And Father, I pray a blessing over the marriage of everyone who hears this. 
Holy Spirit, I can't begin to understand what you know about our hearts. I can't begin to understand what you know about us and where we are and what we're doing. But I do pray, God, please bless every marriage. Bless every person who's been wounded by marriage that they would be healed. Bind us together, God, as one people, marching towards your kingdom and your will in all things. I praise you, Father, Son, Spirit. Amen. Uh, good evening, Journey. Um, behind me are some of the young men and I who are, well, we are part of the youth group and we're planning on going to Kenya as a mission trip. Uh, on your bulletin boards, there's a lunch at the, on the 18th. Um, that's a mistake. It's supposed to be on the 24th, but we'll have that rectified soon. If you can just mark over that with a pen if you're interested so you know when the event is at the correct date. Um, we also have some roses being sold outside of the sanctuary. You know, we're raising money so we can go on this event, and well, the roses can be for anyone. It can be for your loved ones. It can be for a significant other. It can be for your friend, honestly, if you, <laughs> if you guys are that close. But uh, besides that, we would very much appreciate anything you guys would give us so we can go do God's work. Thank you for listening. Good morning, church. Hey, morning. Um, so I get the opportunity to baptize my friend Katie. Um, so Katie, I'm going to lead you in a statement of confession. So repeat after me. I believe. I believe. That Jesus is a Christ. Jesus is a Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. And I confess him. I confess him. As my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. Um, so guys can go get some of the team so he um, so they can watch. So I baptize you in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. gift of life in you. Please help us to know and follow hard after you all the days of our lives.
intercession. Give me one glorious ambition for my life to know and follow hard after you. To know and follow hard after you.